and welcome to the MBSE Embassy. Today we'll be talking about complexity. Now people often say why do we need to do MBSE? Why do we need to apply model-based systems engineering? There are many reasons why but three of the fundamental reasons are what we refer to as the evils of systems engineering or model-based systems engineering and they are complexity, a lack of understanding and communications. Now, the second and third of those, the lack of understanding and communications, we'll leave for another video. Today, we're going to be focusing on complexity. The first thing we need to understand is actually the nature of complexity. And to do that, let's just consider a, a simple hypothetical system that comprises of three things, A, B, and C. It doesn't really matter what these three things are. They could be systems, they could be organizations, they could be people. There could be requirements. Let's just for the moment imagine that they're requirements. So A represents a requirement, B represents a requirement, and C represents a requirement. Now let's imagine that between us, between our team of key stakeholders, we understand each one of those requirements. We understand A, we understand B, and we understand C. People will often then make the assumption that we actually understand the requirements as a whole because we understand the individual requirements. But this is simply not the case. Because what we're not doing here is seeing the relationships between them. One of the basic tenets of systems engineering is systems thinking. And one of the key parts of systems thinking is actually not just thinking about things by themselves, but actually thinking about the relationships between things. Now, we tend to think about things as lists when we write them down. However, when we think about them in our heads, we don't. And this is very, very important. So I'm going to make this diagram more complex now. And I'm not going to change A, B, and C. I'm not going to change them at all. What I'm going to do is increase the relationships between A, B, and C, like so. By increasing the relationships between A, B, and C, I'm actually increasing the number of potential interactions between A, B, and C, and therefore the complexity because complexity will often manifest itself on the relationships between things. So by adding in the blue lines, I've actually made this whole diagram more complex. I can take this one step further. I can add in some more lines. So let's add in some green lines. This diagram is now more complex again. It's more complex than when we just had the blue lines. It's certainly more complex than when we didn't have any lines at all. And if I want to go to the extreme, I can add in yet more lines. Let's add in some red lines at this point. So again, this is more complex than the green, more complex than the blue, and certainly way, way more complex than when we just had the, the A, B, and C in black with no lines on there at all. So one of the things that we need to remember is that complexity will manifest itself on the relationships between things rather than just within itself. Clearly, there is a natural complexity within each of A, B, and C, but what we really need to do is to identify and highlight the complexities between them. Let's take a real life example of this. Um, and I want you to consider cars. My first car was a thing called a Triumph Herald. It was built in 1969. Uh, I had it when it was about 25 years old, and it was a very, very beautiful car. It was a magnificent vehicle. It was built and designed to be maintained. It was that kind of vehicle. If we look at the, let's imagine the electrical system on the Triumph Herald, it had headlights, it had windscreen wipers, and it had a starter motor, and that was it. If I compare that to the car that I now own, I now, I now own a new car, and let's imagine the electrical system on that car, it's orders of magnitude more complex. I've got uh, complex brake systems, I've got locking, I've got an infotainment system, um, it, it's orders of magnitude more complex. Just look at some of the things that we have on there. What's interesting about this, however, about a car system, is that the basic function of getting from A to B, the basic requirement of getting from A to B, has not changed. The basic interface that I have with the car has also not changed. I've got a steering wheel, a gear stick, and some pedals. However, the technology involved in implementing this, the technology involved in realizing this basic requirement of getting from A to B has changed by orders of magnitude. And what's changed there is the complexity of the system. So when we consider a system from 50 years ago, the original Triumph Herald, and then we consider 
a system of today, a new car, we can see that they're orders of magnitude more complex. Now, 50 years ago, we can probably get away with a document-based system to allow us to understand and develop that system. However, today, there's simply just too much complexity and we can't cope with it. It's as simple as that. Another point to make when it comes to complexity is that there are two basic types of complexity. We have what's known as accidental complexity and what's known as essential complexity. Now, essential complexity is called essential because it's in the essence of the system. And you might think there's not a lot we can do about that because it's just how complex something naturally is. Accidental complexity, on the other hand, we can do something about. It's our fault. So first of all, let's visit each of these and see how we can um, manage those by applying things like modeling. So essential complexity, as we said, is in the essence of the system. It's just how complex something naturally is. But what can we do about it? Very importantly, we can't just ignore it. We can identify where the complexity lives. So imagine our A, B and C again, and imagine us drawing on those lines. And then, very importantly, we can limit the way that we interact uh, across these complexity lines. We can mitigate against the risk of complexity by optimizing the, the way that we interact. So we can manage the interfaces between things, and that will help us to control this complexity. We may not be able to reduce essential complexity, but we can certainly control essential complexity. When we consider accidental complexity, we certainly can do a lot more about that because that's our fault. That's complexity that's been introduced by our people, process and tools, by inefficiencies in them, by lack of understanding in them, by communication problems in them. You can probably see where we're going with this. So there we can identify where the complexity lives. Yes, we can control that complexity by managing the interfaces like we can with the essential complexity, but we could also minimize that complexity as well by applying things like patterns, uh, by applying frameworks, ontologies, and so on. So that's the nature of complexity, really. Uh, it's a very real thing, and as time goes on, complexity increases and increases, and so the need for more rigorous techniques, such as model-based model systems engineering, increases. The other interesting thing about complexity is complexity has a shape. Now, this shape is not an ordinary shape. This shape looks something like this. Complexity has the same shape as a brontosaurus. In fact, this is not just any brontosaurus. This is what we call the brontosaurus of complexity. And complexity, the shape of complexity, complies to what's known as the brontosaurus theory. The brontosaurus theory was first defined in 1971 by Anne Elk. And the brontosaurus theory states that a brontosaurus is very thin at one end, it's much, much thicker in the middle, and it's very thin again at the other end. And complexity is the same. Let's imagine any sort of project that we're undertaking. When we begin a project, we're at the smiley face of the brontosaurus. We look into the smiley face of the brontosaurus, and the complexity is analogous with the thickness of the brontosaurus. So we look at the smiley face of the brontosaurus, and the complexity is low. We understand it. It's like A, B, and C, again, from our initial diagram. We smile at the brontosaurus. The brontosaurus smiles back. We wink at the brontosaurus. The brontosaurus winks back. And the world is a very, very happy place. However, we then start to apply things like modeling techniques, our MBSC techniques. Something interesting happens, because as we start to apply these techniques, we start to move down the neck of the brontosaurus. And actually, the complexity starts to increase. As the thickness of the brontosaurus increases, so does the complexity of our system. And this is frustrating, because we're actually we're doing the right thing. We're applying our modeling techniques, yet the complexity is increasing all the time. And it increases and increases and increases until we end up in the belly of the brontosaurus. Now, the belly of the brontosaurus is a very, very bad place to be. This is the place when you walk into a room and someone says, here's a diagram, it's as big as a wall, aren't I clever? And the answer is, yes, it's very clever, but the problem is nobody can understand that diagram because it's as big as a wall. Most humans can only remember seven plus or minus two things. So any time you've got ten or more elements on a diagram, it doesn't mean people won't be able to understand it eventually, but it means that people won't be able to understand it just by looking at it. It's also, when we're in the belly of the brontosaurus, we've got different people using different tools, speaking different languages, 
project managers get up and leave, contractors leave halfway through the project. We're using the same tool, but with different version numbers. It's a terrible place to be. The world is very complex. Communication is terrible. What can we do about it? And it's very frustrating because, as I said, we're applying our MDSE techniques, yet the complexity is going up and up. Very often, this will lead people to the erroneous conclusion that applying modeling makes things more complex. It doesn't. What applying modeling does is show us where the complexity lives, and modeling can be brutal. Modeling will show us the relationships on the diagram, on the A, B, and C diagram. It will show us the lines on that diagram, and it, it will be blunt about it. This is what we need to be careful of. We can't leave ourselves in the belly of the Brontosaurus. When we're in the belly of the Brontosaurus, yes, we have a problem, so the um, a, an understanding of the problem that we first specified in the smiley face of the Brontosaurus, and we might even have a solution to that problem that we first specified in the smiley face of the Brontosaurus. But it will be big, it will be verbose, it will be complex, it will be difficult to understand, it will be difficult to communicate to stakeholders. But then something very interesting happens because as we continue to apply our model based systems engineering techniques the complexity starts to go down and it goes down and down and down and down until eventually we arrive at the tail of the brontosaurus the tail of the brontosaurus is our goal what we have at the tail of the brontosaurus is a concise elegant solution to the problem that we first specified in the smiley face of the brontosaurus it's as simple as we can get it, but no more so. It's easy to understand, and we can communicate it effectively to our various stakeholders. This is where we want to be in on the tail of the Brontosaurus. However, in real life, we can't get to the tail of the Brontosaurus without first traveling through the belly of the Brontosaurus. When we start on any project, the complexity starts to go up before ultimately it will go down again to where we want to be. And it's this transition between the smiley face and the tail that we need to manage. We need to keep that belly as thin as possible. And this is where our model-based systems engineering techniques come in. Things like ontologies, frameworks, processes, patterns, and so on. If we can apply these effectively, it'll make the transition from the smiley face to the tail of the brontosaurus as short and as painless as possible. Now, you may think that that's where the analogy of the brontosaurus and complexity ends, but it isn't, because in a final twist, complexity is definitely real, but it's very difficult to perceive. The brontosaurus, on the other hand, is very easy to perceive, even with a drawing like this, but never actually existed. It's a completely made-up dinosaur.